We come into a time of confession. The proof of God's amazing love to us is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And we trust in God's faithfulness and compassion. And in doing so, we also confess our sins before God. Our prayer of confession is on the screen this morning. Let us pray. Merciful God, for the things we have done that we regret, for the sins we have failed to feel guilty for, for all the times we have acted without love. Forgive us. For all the times we have acted without thought. Forgive us. For all the times we have failed to apologize. Forgive us. For all the times we have failed to forgive. Forgive us. For the hurtful words said, for the times we neglect you and others, for the unfinished tasks and unfulfilled hopes. Hear the good news. Even though we confess our sins and we are not without blame, happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. People of God, having confessed our sins together, know you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen? Amen. We have a time this morning to give of our gifts and let us give as God has given to us.
The scripture today is 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, 
take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy, with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. Send now your spirit into this place. Open our hearts and our minds to hear what you are speaking. Help us to write it upon our hearts and to live it faithfully each and every day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This sermon is about what is beauty. Probably not what you were expecting after you read that passage, but this sermon is about what makes a person beautiful. Of course, you might be wondering what I'm going to say about beauty, because beautiful means different things to different people. Most people know the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What looks beautiful to one person might or might not look beautiful to another person. People have different tastes in cars, houses, styles of clothing, and yes, of course, other people too. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Basically, that's saying people see things differently. But the same can be said about God and us. Today, we're looking at 1 Samuel 16, and we read what God sees and what humans see are often very different. And we're seeing that what God, what makes a person beautiful according to us is not what always what makes a person beautiful according to God. So this sermon is about what God sees as beautiful. Okay. 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16 is about the anointing of King David. And it actually, the story begins earlier in the book of 1 Samuel. In the beginning of 1 Samuel, the people of Israel had called for a king. They had never had a king before, and they wanted a king. In the Old Testament culture and Middle Eastern culture of the day, the king was important because he was a representation of the entire land. You could sum up an entire nation just by looking at a king. So if a king was strong, a good warrior, the nation was thought of as strong and powerful. You don't mess with that nation. You don't go to war with that nation because their king is such a mighty warrior. That's also the reason why kings tended to have many wives and large families. 
Because if the king had an abundance of children, that must mean that the population is healthy and growing. There's also the reason why kings threw feasts. If you went to the king's house and he had a large table full of food, there obviously wasn't a famine going on. There was an abundance of food in the country. What the king looked like and what the king did reflected on the nation as a whole. In the beginning of 1 Samuel, Israel wanted a king, and they wanted a king who would make them look strong, big, powerful king. And they got who they asked for. They got Saul, a tall and impressive man who's described as a head taller than everyone else. He's a big person. We don't usually use beautiful when referring to males for some reason, but we'll say this. Saul looked good to the people of Israel. He looked good. And this kingly, good-looking guy started off well. He did what impressive warrior kings do. He crushed enemies. He won important battles. And on the outside, it looked like things were going well. But as Saul continued to rule, it becomes clear that Saul does not trust in the Lord. Again and again, he does things that are right in his eyes, but not in God's eyes. He follows his will, not God's will. And instead of a faithful king, Israel had a king who ignored God. In chapter 15, just prior to our passage, Saul had openly defied God, and God openly rejected Saul. So that's why Samuel is being sent looking for a new king. God reveals to Samuel he has a plan. There is a person out there who will become king and be faithful. There is a person who will become king and lead the people back to God. And this future king is one of Jesse's sons. So under the pretext of going to give a sacrifice, Samuel goes to Jesse and really scopes out his sons. But the interesting part of our passage is this. While Samuel is looking for the new king, he's doing the exact same thing the people of Israel did. He's looking at the outward appearance. That's why when Samuel sees Eliab, and Eliab looks like a good kingly material, he thinks this is the Lord's chosen. Right? Eliab's appearance and height scream out, this is the new king. But of course the Lord hadn't chosen Eliab. In fact, the Lord hearing Samuel's thoughts rebukes him. And it's the only rebuke of Samuel that we have in the Bible. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16 reveals something really important. When God looks at a person, he isn't using human standards of what is good or what is beautiful. He's looking to see what's in here, right here. And he's judging if the heart of a person is beautiful or not. And it isn't just God's words to Samuel that show that either. Because we know that God looks at the heart because he chooses David as king. Now a lot of people make a big deal in our passage about David as a boy or a teenager in the very least. But really, even though David is a child in our passage, when David grows up, he actually looks very similar to Saul. 1 Samuel shows and contrasts two kings. Here's Saul, tall, impressive, kingly. That's what he looks like. He has an impressive resume. He wins battles. He defeats enemies. And then there's David. And physically, this boy will actually grow up to look much like Saul. Right? David is even described as ruddy-looking, good-looking. David will become a military leader and an impressive king. Physically, David and Saul are very similar. But God looks down from heaven and he sees David and David is beautiful. Why? Because in Saul's heart there's greed and wickedness and unfaithfulness. He doesn't follow God. He does what he wants. And God sees that and that's not beautiful. No matter what his outside appearance is, God doesn't see him as beautiful. But then there's David, who will grow up to look good and be an impressive king, but David is beautiful. Why? 
because it's David who writes the Psalms, these expressions of worship. It's David who sincerely wants to build a temple for God, a place where God can reside. It's David who's called a man after God's own heart, whose faith in God increases day after day, whose love and obedience to God are seen in so many of his actions. And even when David fails, and he does fail, it's David who gets down on his knees and sincerely begs and asks to be forgiven. God looks down at this boy who will grow up into a wonderful king, and it isn't the ruddy good looks or the military prowess that makes David beautiful. It's a heart full of love, faithfulness, full of worship, ready to obey God. That's what makes David beautiful. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. These words are not just true in the Old Testament. They're true for us today. When God sees a person, he doesn't see if they're rich or poor, tall or short, whether they drive a Bentley or drive a gremlin. He sees us for who we are, proud or humble, faithful or faithless, full of love or full of ourselves. That's what God sees when he sees us. This is a very challenging passage to those of us who live in North America, who live in this country. In North America, in the United States, appearances matter. They matter. We spend money on things that look good or things that make us look good. From clothes to shoes, cars, houses, so many things. We spend money making our houses look nice, apartments look nice, furnishing them out. We make t spend time making sure our cars look spotless. I don't know how much time people spend doing that. We don't want something functional in our lives. We want things that are beautiful so we can enjoy them. And yes, so that other people can see them and be impressed by it. That is also true. Let's all admit appearances matter to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't mow our yards. We wouldn't buy new clothing. We wouldn't do a lot of things that we do, but we do it because appearances matter. And it is a very rare person who doesn't care at all about appearances. Most of us care, really care. And if not about one thing, we care about another. God isn't saying get rid of everything you own. That's not what he's saying. God isn't calling us to stop mowing our yards. He's not calling us to stop washing our cars. But he is telling us these things about you are not what God finds important. Listen, the moment we believed, God filled us with the Holy Spirit. God breaks into our hearts and fills us with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God calls us out of the ugliness of sin the foulness of pride and selfishness, and he calls us into a new life with Christ. He shows us ways to be full of love to him and others. He walks with us as we try to shed anger and jealousy and try to learn real deep compassion and kindness. These things that God calls us to be, these are the things that make a person truly beautiful. These are the things that make a person beautiful. A heart full of faith is more beautiful than the most expensive car, the most beautiful of house or clothes or makeover or whatnot. And in our passage, God says, this is what I see and this is what is important. It's what's in here. It's what's in here that decides whether a person is really beautiful or not. Appearances matter. I'm going to be honest, that it's a lie that we hear every day. 
appearances are great, but when we get wrapped up in them, when we dress to impress, when we buy new cars to impress, when we spend dollars upon dollars to make our living space more beautiful, and I'm not saying that's always bad, but when we put that to the exclusion of cultivating what's in here, then there's something wrong. God puts it in perspective. At the end of the day, are we more concerned about having a nice car or more worried about learning kindness, compassion, and love to others? Are we more concerned about what we have and what we look like or are we more concerned with growing in Jesus Christ? That's what God is asking. That's the challenge in our passage. To value what God sees instead of polishing and pruning what everyone else sees. And and I do. I hope we cultivate love and joy and all these things that the Holy Spirit pours into us with the same enthusiasm as, as shopping or fixing the house or washing the car. I hope we work to cultivate love and joy and faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that God sees that and smiles and says, that is beautiful. That's the first challenge in our passage this morning, to value what God sees as beautiful in us. But there is also another, uh, another challenge, and that's to see others as God sees them. Even Samuel got this wrong, right? He saw Eliab, and he didn't see, he saw the physicalness, he didn't see what was in the heart. Let's admit that how we view people or how someone looks like affects how we view them. What someone looks like affects us. What a person wears, what they own, what they drive, what language they speak, where they come from, it affects how we think about them, how we talk to them, if we talk to them. What a person looks like affects how we treat people. We tend to pay attention, more attention to people who look like us or people who are similar to us. And we're hesitant. Most people are hesitant around those who look different, who come from different backgrounds or have different stories than our own. And our passage challenges us in what we see when we see someone. There's a, a movie called Shallow Hell. I am not telling you to go watch this movie. <laughs> Um, it's not that great of a movie. I didn't find it that great of a movie, but it is an interesting premise. In the movie, Hal is very shallow, hence the name of the movie. He will only date women who are very, very beautiful until one day he's in an elevator and he is hypnotized. Like I said, very interesting movie. But he's hypnotized that he can only see someone's inner beauty. And he walks out of the elevator and he meets a woman who, according to the standards of this world, is not beautiful. But to him, because he can see what she looks like inside, or only sees what she looks like inside, she's beautiful. Because she's kind and compassionate, loving, warm, and gentle. And he sees that beauty. And he's attracted to that beauty. And of course, the movie continues, and it takes leaps and turns and whatnot, and and everyone ends up happy. But I always thought that it was an interesting premise. The idea of seeing people by their traits instead of seeing people by their outward appearance. What if we as Christians couldn't see people by their appearance? What if we didn't judge people by what they owned or where they came from? What if we saw people for who they truly were? What if those traits that are in their hearts are what we saw when we look at them? How many people would appear very different in this world? How different would people look if we view them according to what's in here? And I'll be honest, I imagine that some would look radically different than we see them now. And maybe not just different, but people who look good might actually look ugly. Because we see what's in their hearts and it's greed, violence, uncaringness, selfishness. And how many people on the flip side who we normally wouldn't talk to, they would look different. They would stand out. People have nothing that makes them stand out in this world, and yet if we looked at them like God does, they would stand out because their hearts are full of love. 
love of God, and love for people. My point is this. We can look at people, and people look different, similar, same, beautiful, whatever. But what we see often doesn't mean a thing. There are beautiful people in this world who appear great, but if we saw what was in their hearts, they would be ugly. And there are people in this world that we wouldn't give a second glance at or even look scary or dirty who are beautiful on the inside. The lie that we hear that appearances matter should not be what governs our thoughts and our actions. Instead, it should be this truth. God sees in the heart, and what's in the heart is important. And that's a challenge for us as individuals, and for us as a church, too. When people walk in these doors who are different than us, it means nothing. It may look different, but the only thing that matters is what God sees. And when he sees a heart of faith and a heart of love, that person is beautiful. 1 Samuel 16 is a challenge. It is a challenge to how we think and what's important to us. Because at the end of the day, a heart that believes in God is full of love, is beautiful. No matter what that person drives or owns or how they dress or what they look like, that's what's important. And may we find that just as important as God does. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we hear in Scripture a challenge. Often we are so obsessed about how we look like, what our things look like, how we appear to others, and making things look nice and beautiful. And Lord, you help put that in perspective. That while these things are great in the end, we are called to cultivate what's in our hearts. Joy, faith, love, compassion, kindness. These things that you pour into us through your spirit. And you call us to put aside things that the world sees as important. And to look at people for who they are. Lord, as we go out from this place, as we engage with other people, as we see people in our daily lives, as we invite people into this church, into this space, may what is in their hearts be how we think about them. May what you see as beautiful be what we think is beautiful as well. And Lord, this is only possible through your Holy Spirit who teaches us, trains us, convicts us, and speaks again. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with us as we grow in faith, and as we have eyes that seek to see people and ourselves the way you see us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Normally, at this time we stand and we sing and i'm going to be honest i could not find a psalm and maybe someone else can find a hymn that talks about the subject we talked about this morning but there is something the church has done in the past and the church still does and that's the call for holy living or god's will for our lives and i actually am just going to choose colossians 3. In the Bible, we hear many things that God calls us to be. And I want to take us a moment to read. This is what God calls us to be, and these are the things that are ugly and the things that are beautiful. Colossians 3, starting in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And we would say people who walk in this are not beautiful. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices 
and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in is all and is in all. Therefore, it's God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. God calls us to these things and to walk in these ways because at the end of the day, that is beauty. Amen.